Well, good morning, church. My name is Seth. I'm the family minister here. And are you ready to eat a ton of food this Thursday? Because I know I am. I am excited. Thanksgiving is a fantastic holiday because you just get to eat a million different things. And you don't have to feel guilty at all. Because that's what the day is about. I'm just kidding. The day is about being thankful for things. So I encourage you, tell your parents that you're thankful for them, uh, kids and even adults. They will appreciate it. Um, But I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. The first one being that we will be accepting coats, hats, gloves, and blankets for the homeless. And you can place those in bins. They're going to be located right outside here in Fellowship Hall. So you'll see some bins there. We need those by December 3rd. So if you want to bring those, I guess that would be... Uh, this ne- the next couple of weeks. And so if you want to put those in the bins right outside here, that would be fantastic. The second thing is if you would like to donate gift certificates for foster family support, we'll be accepting those until December 11th. And so you can look for tags on the Christmas tree in Fellowship Hall. So that's just right outside there. You'll see the Christmas tree with all those tags on there. If you just want to grab one of those, it will tell you exactly what you need to get. And lastly, this is something I'm a little partial to myself. The Fountain Teens Ski Retreat is coming up February 10th through the 12th. And so this is something I'm pretty excited about. We did this last year, and it was a ton of fun. If you're not a skier, that's okay. There is a non-ski option. However, skiing is so much more fun. And you get to see your friends crash and fall, and it's a whole really great time. Uh, So I encourage you to be a part of that. We're going to have a blast Uh, But thanks for joining us. Would you guys stand as we enter into a time of worship? Join in singing 
Psalms 113, verses 2 through 4 says, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Let's continue to sing, church, with a grateful heart and bless the name of our Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. my glasses up here just in case I'm getting to that age. We'll see how it works out. My name is Nathan, Nathan Cecil, good friends with Mr. Hahn right down here. He's the senior pastor here at the Fountain, and uh, I'm filling in. Been here many times. It's been a while. It's good to see you all. 
can hardly see you out there, got the lights going on. But we're in this series, aren't we, called Making Change. I love the uh, play on words there, Making Change. It's all about money and how our money and our resources impacts us in our walk with Jesus and how Jesus wants to teach us about our money and how to use our money and how to not use our money. And so we're actually coming to the end. This is week five in the five-week series. And so um, we're in the book of Luke. Now, Luke is a gospel. It tells us the story of Jesus. Uh, There's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke, um, as we know, is a physician, and he was likely a wealthy man who had money. And he's writing to a man named Theophilus. We see that in the beginning of Luke. And Theophilus is likely a, a politician, probably wealthy himself. So it's one wealthy guy writing to another wealthy guy. And then throughout the story of Jesus that Luke shares, there's time and time again, Jesus begins talking about, teaching about money. And so we get a look into those, to those areas of life that, bring, that talk about money. And so we, we're, we're looking back. So look at week one. We talked about guarding against greed. Remember the guy, he wanted to build more and more for all his stuff because he was getting wealthier and wealthier, and then God took his life from him that next day. And, and we learned that um, we need to be rich, rich towards God you know, instead of rich towards the things of this world and the stuff that money can buy. Week two, we talked about not worrying, not being anxious. God, He provides for the, the sparrows. He has clothed the, the, the flowers of the field. They're beautiful. How much more will He provide and care for us, His image bearers and His creation? And so we talked about not worrying and not pursuing money, but rather pursuing righteousness and all the other things will follow. God will take care of us. Week three was the... Um, I just listened to this one. That was a weird one, wasn't it? The dishonest manager who shrewdly used his money. It's a tough one. That was a tough one to preach. I'm glad I didn't get that one. Um, but it, it talked about using the, the, the things of this world, the money of this world, to think about what is next, what it, uh, eternity will look like. And, and the lesson there was at the very end, we, did, we learned that we can't serve two masters. We can't serve both God and money. We will love the one and hate the other. We can't serve two masters. And then last week, was that depressing story, <laughs> the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He had it all together. He said, Jesus, I'm doing it all. I'm following all the laws. And Jesus is like, yeah, there's one more thing, your money. You just, you just need to give it all away and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler, he went away sad because he couldn't do it. His, his money had a grip on him rather than he controlling his money, his money keeping us from following Jesus. We, and, and last week, we were challenged to examine our hearts. This week, we're in the final week of uh, this series. I'm going to try to land the plane, so to speak, and we're in this story that I'm sure most of us are familiar with. If you are of my generation or older and you grew up in the church and you remember Sunday school and you go to, we, we would sing this song. And I'm just going to sing a little bit for you, and if you want to join in, feel free. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Lord, he passed that way, he looked up in that tree, and he said, You come down from there, for I'm going to your house today. Remember that song? I tell you guys are getting excited about it. Zacchaeus is our story today, so we're going to be in the book of Luke again, um, chapter 19. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn to chapter 19 or your phone app or you got the Church Center app, you can download that and open it quick and it has some notes in there and you can follow along. But just to set some quick context, Jesus is on a mission, okay? Back in chapter 9, verse 51 of Luke, it says that Jesus set his face resolutely for Jerusalem, and so he is going to begin traveling to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, we know the story, the Passover, he, he celebrates the Passover with his followers, but then he ends up going to the cross and dying for your sins and for mine. And he conquers death, he raises back to life and spends 40 days with his, with his people, and he, he, he is taken back up into heaven. So he is on a mission to get to that point in time, but he doesn't lose focus of the people around him, people who are hurting, people who need to hear his teaching, people who need healing. As a matter of fact, as we're coming into chapter 19, Jesus encounters a blind man, and he heals him right before he enters this town of Jericho. The blind man cries out to him, Jesus, have mercy on me, and he comes to him, and he says, what do you want from me? And he says, I want to have sight, and he says, your, your faith has healed you. He heals this blind man on the outskirts of, of Jericho, and then he begins his journey through this town of Jericho. So if you have your Bible, turn to chapter 19. 
Verse 1, we're going to start there. Um, He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. Chief tax collector, rich, his name is Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus is a Hebrew name. He was, this, this man was usually, probably an uh, Israelite, a Jew, and it means pure. So Zacchaeus, the pure one, okay? So we learn that Zacchaeus is living in this town of Jericho, which is likely a wealthy town. It was kind of a resort town. It was always pretty warm there, and people would, would have homes there where they would kind of vacation to. And so Zacchaeus is a, in this wealthy town, and we learn that he is a tax collector, And not just any tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. Unfortunately, that's not a great thing for someone to be who is an Israelite living in Israel because they were not liked. You see, they worked for the enemy, the Roman government. See, the Romans occupied that territory, as you may know, and they taxed the people. And then they would hire people to collect those taxes for them. And so somehow, some way, Zacchaeus got roped in to being one of these tax collectors, and he must have been pretty good at it, because this is the only place we see that anyone called a chief tax collector. So he was like over other tax collectors, and the way that these tax collectors made their money on top of the Roman government probably paying them to collect taxes is they would, they would figure out ways to get people to pay eh, a little bit more, a little bit more than the actual tax that was owed, and they begin to line their own pockets, and they did pretty well for themselves. And so here's, here's Zacchaeus who's a chief tax collector, who probably has other tax collectors under him who are lining their own pockets, and then he probably gets a cut of theirs. And so we learn that he is a rich man. It's like like the very first pyramid scheme, you know, maybe. Or maybe that was the Egyptians. Anyways, so Zacchaeus, okay, you're awake. All right, here we go. We're we're working now. Um, So Zacchaeus, he's a Israelite. He is pure, the pure one, but he's a tax collector, and he's probably despised. People probably can't stand the guy because he's always, well, he works for the enemy. He works for the enemy. But here's a question. As, I, as I'm going through this this week, all these questions were coming out. And so I'm just going to share the questions with you. And here's the first question. Like Zacchaeus, am I rich? We're talking about money, right? Who here is rich? That's an awkward question, isn't it? I was listening to a sermon series years ago by a guy named Andy Stanley, and he was talking about money. It was, it was, the series was How to Be Rich, and obviously this was How to Be Rich Towards God was the ultimate point of that series, but here's how he defined being rich. He said, if you have more than you need, you are rich. Simple. If you have more than you need, you are rich. And so I'm sitting in my office this week, my home office, and, I'm, and, and we have this room that has a bed in it that nobody sleeps in most of the time. It's just there in case anybody needs it. We have five televisions in my home. We have two refrigerators and a deep freeze. I have a room that's just for two of my cars to park in. I'm thinking, all these clothes, all these shoes, like, man, I have more than I need, so much more than I need. I'm rich. (laughs) Do you have more than you need? Think about all your stuff. I'm not talking wants. Right? We always talk, you know, that's a great teaching tool for the kids. Is that a need or is that a want? Most of our needs are met. Most of us in this room are rich. Like Zacchaeus, we are rich. If you're listening to this message, think about, am I rich? Verse 3, and he was seeking, so Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So Zacchaeus learns that Jesus is coming into Jericho, and all of a sudden he realizes, here is my chance to see this man. And, 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 the, and the verbiage here is he really, I mean, there is a strong desire to see Jesus, and this is his chance. And maybe he's heard about Jesus, most likely he has, because his curiosity is pretty high. Maybe he's heard, there's this guy going around, he may be possessed with demons, he's doing some crazy stuff. Or maybe he heard that he could be like a prophet raised from the dead. Like maybe he's Elijah come back. He's he's doing incredible miracles. He's teaching with authority that we have never seen. He, He calls himself the son of man. Maybe he's the son of God. Maybe, maybe he's the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. We're not exactly sure what Zacchaeus knew or had heard about Jesus, but whatever it was, 
Man, his curiosity was maxed out, and he had to see him. But there was a problem. Crowds. People were crowded around Jesus. Jesus had been walking around and doing things for a couple of years now, and so people were following him, always around him. And Zacchaeus couldn't get to him, and he wasn't about to go into the crowd because he's a tax collector, and I'm guessing some not-so-nice things would be happening to him if he tried to work his way. People would realize who he was. He wasn't going to do that. And he had another problem. He's vertically challenged. He was short. And as I think of Zacchaeus, I don't know why, but I, I, I kept thinking, I had a picture in my head of Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito... <laughs> And Zacchaeus are similar. Now, this is a picture of me and Danny DeVito. It's George Clooney. I know you're thinking, is that Nathan? Like it, it happens all the time. No. So he's like four, I think 4'10. Um, Clooney's 5'11. So he's my height. And so, like, he's vertically challenged. And, and I can appreciate vertically challenged people because I live with one, I married one. Now, she's 4'11 and a half, she would say. She's 4'11 on a good day with a full moon and in shoes, but she's short. And I see the challenges that vertically challenged people have to get to the top shelf in our kitchen cabinets. Pardon me, but she has to jump up like a monkey onto the cabinet with her, on her knees to reach up. And I just, bless her heart. And the most recent thing is we got this new shower head that you have to reach up and turn this switch to get it down to spray, you know, when you're cleaning it, and she can't reach it. And normally... I'm the one that's cleaning the shower, but there's been a few weeks when I haven't been home on a Saturday when we do our cleaning, and I'll get a text, inevitably, you need to come home and clean your stupid shower because I am soaked from trying to clean it. Because she's vertically challenged. Vertically challenged people, the world is not made for, for short people. I've heard that many times. And so, here's Zacchaeus. He is desperate to get to see this man, Jesus. He is he's afraid to go into the crowds because, I mean, there's crowds everywhere, and he can't I mean, there's no way he's going to see over it. And so, verse 4. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Okay, catch that. He ran. This grown man, this tax collector, he takes off running. Now, that's not normal. Let's be honest. Even today, I mean, he, he sets his dignity aside and he decides, I'm going to run. I've got to get ahead of the crowd. I've got to get ahead of Jesus. Because even today, if we see a guy running, unless he's like in shorts and he's exercising, or maybe at the airport and he's, there's a guy running, and you're thinking, oh, he's got to get to his gate. It's not normal to see a grown man running. And, <laughs> but he doesn't care. He realizes, this is my chance. I've got to get ahead. I, I got, he takes off running. So he sets his dignity aside. And then he sets some more dignity aside and climbs a tree. Now, we read these stories, and we just kind of read through them, but think about this for a minute. Zacchaeus gets to the point where he's like, all right, he's probably out of breath. He comes to a tree. He, has a, he thinks it's a, this is a crazy idea, but he doesn't care because he is so desperate to see this guy, Jesus, that he climbs up into a tree. I loved climbing trees when I was a kid. You know, I, we had these two giant trees, and we had you know, tree houses and stuff that kids love, but at a certain age, you stop climbing trees, but... Zacchaeus, he takes off running, and he climbs up in this tree, and he is desperate. He is desperate to get to Jesus, and vertically challenged people are resourceful, and he gets up in that tree. Question, like Zacchaeus, am I in a hurry to see Jesus? Am I in a hurry to see Jesus? Day in and day out. When I wake up in the morning, am I in a hurry to see Jesus, to see Jesus in his word? Am I in a hurry to get on my knees and just spend just a few moments praying to Jesus? We have barriers, don't we? I don't know about you, but I, I wake up on a Monday morning and I've got stuff I got to get done. I got to get to work. I've got kids to deal with, getting them here and there. I've got my phone. That's a constant distraction. If there's a barrier in our life, it's probably these smartphones that we carry around like an appendage to us now. So many distractions with social media, family, all the issues we have going on in life. So many barriers. We could, we could probably all make a, fill a whiteboard with them. But Zacchaeus, he was in a hurry, and he wasn't going to let any barrier stop him from seeing Jesus. And so my challenge this week was to examine my life and ask, what am I in a hurry to see Jesus, to spend time with him every day? And the other thing I thought about was 
<laughs> we're bad about this. Am I in a hurry to get to a Sunday morning service? Do, do I look forward to being here, to gathering with the body where Jesus is uniquely present when he says two or three are gathered in my name, I am there? Are we in a hurry to come here and gather on a Sunday morning? Are we lucky to just make it by the end of the first or second song? <laughs> Think about that. Allow Zacchaeus' story to challenge us this morning. Verse 5, and then when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. Okay, imagine that moment. Here's Zacchaeus. He's run ahead. He's got to the tree. He's climbed up in it. And he can see Jesus in the distance and the crowds. And he's like, oh, this is going to be perfect. And Jesus begins to move and he's getting closer and he's coming. Oh, he's going to come, he's going to come right by my tree. This is going to be amazing. And then all of a sudden, Jesus kind of turns. He's like, oh, he's going to get really close to my tree. I'm going to get a, like a really close up view. What's going on? And, he, and, and Jesus just walks right up to the tree. And here's Zacchaeus in the tree. And it's not just Jesus, right? There's a whole crowd of people. And Jesus stops at the base of the tree, and Zacchaeus had to be thinking, what is going on? What is happening? And Jesus looks up, and I don't know how many hundreds of other people are looking up, and they're all staring at this grown man who is in the tree. That's a pretty funny moment if you think about it. And then Jesus says, Zacchaeus, he knows his name. He calls him out, Zacchaeus. You can imagine the crowd, if they know who he is, which probably they did, they're like, oh gosh, it's Zacchaeus. What's G- he- I, was in Chick- I walked into Chick-fil-A Friday morning because I'm going go to go drive to Terre Haute for work, and I walk in, and I walk up, and the lady behind the counter says, Nathan, good morning, what can I get you? She knew my name. <laughs> I said, I will take a sweet tea, please. She knew my name. It feels, our name is one of the sweetest sounds to our ears, right? And when you walk in someplace or someone remembers your name, you're like, wow, I can't remember. I can't believe they knew my name. Imagine if it's Jesus, this guy you've heard about, you just want to get a glimpse of, but he walks right up to Zacchaeus and he knows his, his name. God knows your name. God knows knows our name. You see it throughout Scripture. God, in the, he was walking in the garden. He knew Adam's name. He called Abraham and Moses and Samuel by name. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and what's he do? He knows his guys by name. Peter, Simon, James, John. He begins calling them by name. And just pause for a moment. Jesus, he knows our name. That's, that's a beautiful, beautiful picture And then Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm inviting myself over. I'm coming to your house. And can you imagine Zacchaeus, the outcast of his society, very little friends, probably lonely and isolated, and this man, Jesus, who everybody wants a piece of, all of a sudden says, hey, I'm coming over. I'm going to spend some time with you. And that's a huge deal. Table fellowship, like coming into someone's home, even for us today, to invite someone into your home, it's a big thing, right? You want, you want to sit down with them, get to know them, spend time with them. And he, that's what he tells Zacchaeus. I'm inviting myself over. I'm coming to your house. And what is Zacchaeus' response? Did he climb out of the tree and take off running because he was terrified? No, he was overjoyed. So he ran. He was in a hurry to get to that tree. He was in a hurry to get out of that tree and get down to, to Jesus. And it says, it says that he received him joyfully. Oh, the joy that filled his heart when he realized this man, Jesus, he wants to come to my home. He knows my name. He wants to spend time with me. <sighs> August of 97, I became a Christian. I gave my life to Christ. I was baptized by one of our elders, Gordon Hockmeister. Great name. Gordon, I'd known him since I was little, and so he baptized me. I remember the joy my parents had, the joy that I felt. I called my, my girlfriend at the time. She was a vertically challenged person. I ended up marrying her. I called her up. I said, Alicia, you won't believe what I did today. I, I, I went forward and I gave my life to Christ and I got baptized. And there's so much joy in her family because, I, you know, she, she had really been part of my discipleship process when I saw Christ in her. That I, I, I understood what it was like to have a relationship with Jesus. Oh, there was so much joy. 
And here's the question. I think Zacchaeus, his story poses to us, am I filled with joy because Jesus is in my life? Is that joy that I experienced in that moment when I, when I gave my life to Jesus and said, I, I want to be, and I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and, I, and I gave my, and when you gave your life to Christ, there was probably great joy. Is that joy sustained to this day? Scripture tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And there are days, there are weeks, there are months when life is hard. When things happen and we don't understand why Jesus allowed things to happen or we don't understand why life is as hard as it seems. But those are the times, I believe, when the joy of the Lord can actually be the the strongest. When the strength of Jesus in our lives can be the strongest. James tells us in James chapter 1 verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Even in the hardest, most difficult of times, we can have joy because we can set our eyes on the eternal. We can see the end. The battle continues here, but the war has been won. Jesus has defeated death. We know at some point we will be reunited with him. He will call us by name. We will sit at that wedding feast of the Lamb and and have so much joy in eternity with Christ like Zacchaeus. Am I filled with joy because Jesus is in my life? Because Jesus just entered his life and he was so, so excited. He's coming to his house. I want to look like Zacchaeus. I'll tell you who I don't want to look like. Verse 7, check this out. And when they, the crowd, saw it, they grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Just like the crowd. They see what happened. Jesus walks over to Zacchaeus. You've got to be kidding me. You're going to his house? You know who he is? You know what he does? Ah! And they all started grumbling amongst themselves. This is un. Believable. Zacchaeus is a sinner. Here's a question. Like Zacchaeus, am I a sinner? Are you a sinner? Raise your hand if you're a sinner. That was a lot easier than the rich question. Yeah. Here's this crowd. They're looking around going, Are you kidding me? He's a sinner. A few verses before, there's this story that Jesus tells of the, the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And they go and they pray, and the Pharisee says, oh, but I fast twice a week. I give tithes all that I get. But the, you know what the tax collector said? He stood at a distance and he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. For some reason, it's easy for this crowd to look at Zacchaeus and see a sinner rather than looking at this plank in their own eyes. And they, too, are just as sinful as he is. Just different sins, Right? Like Zacchaeus, am I a sinner? The, the answer is, yeah. And I don't want to look like that crowd. But it's easy to look like that crowd, if we're honest. It's easy to look at the world around us and see how broken and sinful it is and, and point at it and, and talk about it and argue about it and be self-righteous sometimes and cynical and negative. It's easy sometimes to be like the crowd. But man, the crowd could have responded differently, right? They could have realized, oh my goodness, Jesus is going to Zacchaeus' house. We should all stop and pray. Let us all pray that when, when Jesus is talking to Zacchaeus, that he sees the light, he sees the error of his ways, and, and maybe he becomes a follower of Jesus, like we all are, right? But they don't. So let's not be like the crowd. Let's not be like the crowd. And so in the story here, I, I, I think, if I'm reading it right, Zacchaeus goes to the home of Zacchaeus, or Jesus goes to the home of Zacchaeus. Behind closed doors, some conversations take place. We don't know how long. We don't, Jesus may have stayed the night with him. We don't know who all went in with Jesus. Maybe Matthew, the tax collector. Maybe he was there, you know, peek around the corner. Maybe he, maybe he explained to Zacchaeus how his life has changed because he's following Jesus and knows Jesus. We don't know exactly, but the door of Zacchaeus' home opens again in verse 8. 
We finish up. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have offended anyone, anything, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this home, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus, and Jesus makes this proclamation. And I'm pretty sure Jesus knew what the crowds were saying when he went to be with Zacchaeus. Because he comes out and he says, look, this is my mission. This is why I came, to seek and to save the lost. Just like all you people, just like Zacchaeus. That's why I'm here. And he had to remind them of that and reinforce that. I am here to seek and save the lost. That's his mission. And Zacchaeus was lost. Zacchaeus was a lost man, and he knew it. Zacchaeus' heart was moving in the right direction, but he just needed, just needed Jesus. And he got Jesus. And Jesus changed his life. And the first area of life change that we notice, which is why we're talking about it today in this making change, was his money. <laughs> Zacchaeus realized what he was doing, how he was living, the job he had was not honorable was immoral. And he gathered all this wealth and all these riches in a dishonoring way. And so the first thing he says is, I give half of my money away. I give half of it away. And then he says, on top of that, if I have done anything wrong, if I defrauded anyone, which he most likely has, if I took a dollar, I'm going to give him four dollars back. Four times, I'm going to repay, I'm going to repent. He's repenting. That's what's happening here. He's making the wrongs that he's done, he's making them right. And I'm looking at this story, and I'm realizing that this is like the opposite of the rich young ruler, who Jesus challenged him about his money, and he couldn't, he walked away. He was sad. Versus Zacchaeus, who realized, ah, got all these riches. What should I do with them, Jesus? And I don't, we don't know what Jesus told him, but whatever it was, he, he freely opened his hands and he said, I'm giving it away. And we don't know if he had enough money to cover all of the wrongs that he had done. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe he had to figure out ways to, to earn extra money to pay people back. We don't really know any much more about the life of Zacchaeus, but we do know that his life was changed when he encountered Jesus. And, and I'm looking at this story and I'm thinking about the past four weeks and all the things we've learned each week. And I believe that Zacchaeus embodies all of those things. I made a list. Zacchaeus embodies being rich towards God and not greedy. I'm pretty sure before he, he, he probably had some greed welling up in his life when he, when he realized, I can, oh, I can make a lot of money <laughs> doing this tax collector thing. And, and now, instead of pursuing the things of this world, he's now pursuing righteousness. He wants to do the right thing. And Jesus and walking with Jesus. And, and he's also serving God rather than serving his money. He's serving God rather than his money. And finally, he's obeying Jesus. Unlike the rich young ruler who heard what Jesus said, but he just couldn't do it. Zacchaeus heard what Jesus said and said, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to follow you. This is an incredible story of life transformation. And the first impact we see in his life was with his, his money. I used to be actually a financial planner. So I, my background is a CPA. I did uh, CPA work as an accountant for years. And then I got to spend three or four years with a firm called Ronald Blue and & Company. And it's really unique and it's really incredible. They, they, the focus was taking biblical principles and helping people apply them to their finances. This guy, Ron Blue, started the company. He became a Christian and he realized he had all these financial skills, but he wanted to figure out ways to deploy them to advance the kingdom. And so he decided he could fig- help people help Christians figure out ways to give away more money, to be more generous. Now, not everyone we worked with was a, was a believer, was a Christian, and we didn't force our beliefs on them, but we certainly used the Bible as instruction, as wisdom. We'd also use humor. And so, early on in, um, in working with folks and families, we would show this cartoon. It's a guy being baptized and he's like, I give everything to you, Lord, except my money. You know, he's holding it out of the water. He's like, I'm not taking that down with me. And so it, money has a, is a weird thing, right? Because it can get a grip on us. 
And it's hard to, to give God control of our money. It's really cool. It was really a neat experience to work with folks. And they would just begin to slowly look like Zacchaeus and open up their hands more and more and say, how can we funnel more money into the kingdom? And trusting God will provide for all of our needs because we have more than we need. We are rich, and so we want to be rich towards God. It was a pretty cool job. And so as I was thinking about that, some of the challenges we would, we would work with our, our, our people is a couple of challenges I want to issue here this morning. I'm issuing them to myself, and I'm going to present them to you. So challenge number one is this. Look for an area of your financial life to improve. Whenever we would work with people, we would tell, often tell them, meeting with a financial planner is like going to phys- a physician. It can be uncomfortable. You just kind of have to drop your clothes and just lay it all on the table. Because looking at your own financial situation objectively is pretty hard, but it's possible, especially if you have someone, like if you have a spouse or if you have a, planner, a financial planner or somebody like that, to, to just kind of take a broad look at your, your, your finances. Maybe it's an area of budgeting and spending. Where's all my money going? Because you, you control a lot of where a dollar goes. So where are those dollars going? Where are they going out the door? Maybe it's debt. Maybe you got debt. We've got to get this paid down. Get a car paid off, get a credit card paid off, whatever it is, figure out a way that we're going we're gonna to pay off some debt. Maybe that's an area. Maybe it's, maybe it's saving. Hey, we need, we need to save up, you know, in case, you know, what they call it, an emergency fund. An emergency fund or something. We're just going to put me discipline, stop some spending here, do some saving here. Or maybe it's giving. You know what? We're not tithing 10%. We've never done it. I don't know why, but maybe now's the time. You know, we're getting ready to come into a new year, the good old New Year's resolution, but make it more than just that. Make it a, a change that's going to be lasting. So my first challenge, look, look at your financial life objectively as you can and figure out what's one little error, one little thing that you could change. Number two, challenge number two is consider an opportunity to be extra generous. This is, giving away money can be fun. It can be um, challenging too. But we're in this time of se- you know, season of uh, Christmas, and, and there's going to be lots of opportunities um, to give. And so pray about it. Pray as a family. Pray as a couple and say, God, show us where we can make an impact. To take some of the money that you've entrusted to us, because it's all God's anyways, and God, help us to be a good steward and, and to maybe stretch ourselves a little bit to be more generous than we ever have. Give to the point where it's a little uncomfortable. That's a challenge. I want to look like Zacchaeus. I want to overcome any obstacle in my daily life to get to Jesus, to spend time with him, to make sure that that is the number one priority in my life. I want to be filled with joy. I want to be filled with joy because Jesus is in my life, because the Holy Spirit resides in me, and I want that joy to be light in the darkness, because we, when we leave this building, we go out into a dark world that seems to be getting darker every day, but we can have joy, and people can look at us and say, there's something different going on in your life, and I want to be generous. I, I want to take these resources that God has entrusted to me, because at the end of the day, when we all die, how much do we get to take with us? Nothing. So how do we use it faithfully here to advance the kingdom of God? The bottom line today is a little different. It's actually scripture. And we, this is a scripture. It was kind of the theme verse at that company I worked at that did financial planning because it is specific instruction to rich people. <laughs> do you know that? Do you know there's specific instruction to rich people that Paul gives to Timothy and says, here's what I want you to tell rich people. And that's that's us, if we're being honest. So here's, here's what I want you to do. Stand up. And I want you to stand just as Zacchaeus stood before Jesus. It says, he stood before Jesus and he said, Jesus, here and now I give half of my resources away. And anything I've defrauded, I, I get I'll four times it. And so it, it, kind of have this posture of, of, of open hands, whatever you want to do. But I'm going to read this scripture over you. And these are instructions from Paul to Timothy to rich people. Here's what he says. As for the rich in this present age, charge them, instruct them not to be haughty or arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but to set their hope on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, 
to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Let's pray. God, we come before you this morning to worship you, to praise your name. Blessed be your name, just as we sing, Lord. And this topic of money, it's so interesting in how money can, can grip our hearts and our lives. And we know, Lord, we cannot serve both money and you. And so if there's anyone here who is wrestling with this grip of money on their life, Lord, we pray over them that they would be rich towards God and that they would turn to you and just ask for your mercy. God, help us to, um, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, ready to give. Because, God, we want the life that is truly life, and that's life in you. So fill us with joy. Lord, help us to be in a hurry to spend time with you every single day. Because I believe if we do that, we will be generous. We will be joy-filled. Thank you for this time we have to worship you this morning. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We get to move into this time now of communion. You can come forward and get the cups here in a moment. It's a time where we get to celebrate the most generous gift that we've ever seen in the history of the world when God opened his hands and gave us his son to become one of us, to be put on a cross by his creation and and die for the sins of the world and take the ultimate punishment for, for us. When we put our faith in him and our hope in him, we We declare that He is Lord of our life, and we get to declare His death now as we take the cup and the juice and the the bread that represents His body. It's also a time to give an offering, and also in the back there, there's doors that lead to the well. It's an area where if you have a decision to make or just want to talk to somebody, pray with somebody, it's a great place, great place to go, people who want to meet with you you have a need this morning. So let me pray over this time, and then we'll, we'll take communion. Lord, thank you for the gift of communion, that it represents your death. And you say that when we gather, that we can do this to declare the work that you did on the cross dying for us, but also that we'll do this until you come again, and we will have the feast of the Lamb with you in heaven. So now as we partake of this, help us to examine our lives and um, to give thanks for the greatest gift, the most generous gift we've, we've ever experienced, and that's you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.
please stand and sing with us as we continue in our time of worship together.
Romans 8, verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let's continue to sing, church. Sing with a grateful heart and thank our Father for all that he has given us.
church. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power, our God, our God. Oh God, we thank you that you are higher than above anything we are facing. You are higher than our health problems, higher than our financial problems, higher than our family problems. We are leaning on you today, God. We know that you are for us. Who can be against us? No one. We love you and we thank you for your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. 